Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we always look forward to this day and uh, hope that uh, you leave feeling uh, like many of your questions have been answered. And also, I hope, especially um, from some of what I'll be talking about this morning and, and my colleagues as well, that you'll feel a sense of optimism. Uh, I, I think that we are in a very exciting time in psychiatry in general and in schizophrenia in particular. Uh, where we are really turning a quarter in terms of understanding the biology of uh, schizophrenia. Uh, and that is important not only in terms of optimizing the treatments that we have for people who have schizophrenia, uh, but also the possibility of prevention. And ultimately that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, so as I'm um, moving through these slides, I really encourage you uh, if you have questions, uh, to uh, go ahead and write them down on the index cards that you have uh, with your booklet. And at the end of the talk, we will leave plenty of time for questions, uh, and uh, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. So um, let's see if I can figure out how to use this. There we go. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. I won't be talking about any studies today that were sponsored by industry or any other outside entities. So, in order to really understand where schizophrenia comes from, you have to ask a couple of important questions, one of which, of course, is how does schizophrenia arise, but the other is when does schizophrenia arrive? And uh, as I'll talk about, not only are genes incredibly important, but the environment plays an essential role as well, and the particular timing of that interface between genes and environment is incredibly important. I'll also talk about some new research that comes from outside of MGH uh, that is quite interesting and points to a whole new mechanism uh, through which risk for schizophrenia can become instantiated. Uh, and you'll see why it's thinking outside the box and outside the brain. Uh, uh, I'll let you ponder until I get to that part which part of the body outside the brain may be really important and relevant for schizophrenia. And, uh, it, it may be a bit surprising at first, but kind of obvious in retrospect. And then, as I said, I would really like to spend some time talking about prevention and why, uh, one reason why we're excited at this particular time about some recent progress in that direction. So any time you think about a starting point for schizophrenia, you have to think about genetics. Uh, there is no question that genetic loading, or basically the number of genes that you have that predispose to schizophrenia is the most important risk factor for schizophrenia. And what I'm showing here is something called heritability. A, a, the heritability of a disorder is the percentage of risk of that disorder that is directly related to genes. And as you can see, uh, schizophrenia is quite high on the order of 80%. It's one of the highest in psychiatry, in fact. Um, so, uh, obviously, it's important to understand the genetic basis of the disorder. And this has been a real struggle because if it had been a single gene or a small number of genes, we would have found it a long time ago. Uh, it's only quite recently with very large studies involving hundreds of thousands of participants that we've made some real headway in this regard. So um, these studies all use an approach called genome-wide association, which basically is you look at every genetic variant in the genome, and for each variant, you look to see if the frequency of that version of the gene is different, say higher or lower, in people who have schizophrenia versus people who don't have schizophrenia. And you do that across you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, particular spots along the genome. And what we see is that, again, there's no one gene that accounts for a large amount of signal, but rather there are lots and lots of genes that each contribute a small amount of signal. And just as an example of the kind of progress that has been made recently, in 2011, uh, with um, about 20,000 participants, there were five specific spots in the genome uh, that we refer to as genome-wide significant, meaning that they are sufficiently strong that they pass the threshold for the very stringent uh, correction that we need to apply for doing lots and lots of statistical tests. Uh, fast forward to 2014, now up to 150 participants, and we've gone from five to 108 spots along the genome. 
uh, that have a significant association with schizophrenia risk. Uh, the most recent analysis uh, has not yet been published, but now we are up to well over 200 spots along the genome, and that, that number will continue to increase. Um, at the same time, it's important to understand what each of these spots along the genome means in terms of its contribution to schizophrenia risk. I've, I've shown this slide before. I think the last time was a couple of years ago. So um, if, if you were here then and remember, uh, 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 no, no cheating. But uh, so this is the strongest uh, spot in the genome uh, that is associated with schizophrenia risk. It's in a very large and complex gene called the major histocompatibility complex that actually has to do with immune function and inflammation. And just to illustrate how these analyses work, you know, there are two versions of that gene. There's an A version and a G version. And we see that the A version is overrepresented in people who have schizophrenia, where 86.4% of people with schizophrenia have the A version and 13.6% have the G version. So, Anybody want to guess, uh, in healthy individuals, what percent, which is going to be something lower than 86.4, uh, have this copy of, of the gene? 17 or 70? 70. 70. 50. Do I have higher? Do I have lower? Going once. 13.6. Where did that come from? So it's small, right? Um, it's incredibly statistically significant because we're talking about 150,000 people in the study. But you know, even the strongest signal by itself contributes only a very tiny fraction. And if you have you know, the, the A version of this gene, your chance of having schizophrenia is only very marginally higher uh, than it would be if you had the G version of the gene. That said, we are now understanding how all of these small effect size genetic variants work together so that in combination with each other, uh, we are getting a very detailed quantitative picture of an individual's risk for schizophrenia based on their variants up and down the entire genome. And with these technologies making it easier and cheaper to do genome-wide genotyping and ultimately genome sequencing, which is where you literally go through and determine the, the sequence A, G, C, T along the entire genome. Uh, we are now able to do this. So in, uh, remember this data is now eight, uh, four years old. Uh, while you know, each specific variant only contributes a very small amount of signal, you put them together and you get 18%. And that number will continue to go up. And ultimately, the goal is to account for that full 80 or so percent of heritability of schizophrenia that is attributed to genes. Now, that being said, there was uh, a very important paper that came out uh, just a couple of months ago that you may have even heard about in the media that illustrates the point that while genetic loading is the biggest risk factor for schizophrenia, it is not specific to schizophrenia. So you'll note that a lot of these disorders have a strong degree of heritability. And as it turns out, uh, they also share a strong amount of genetic liability. So this was a very interesting study looking at a large number of individuals who had a range of psychiatric disorders and a range of neurologic disorders as well. And what the investigators, some of whom are here at Mass General, were interested in is the degree of genetic overlap um, first of all, a across psychiatric disorders, and then across neurologic disorders, and then say between psychiatric and neurologic disorders. After all, you know, we, we are two specialties in medicine that, that share the same organ, so it wouldn't be surprising if there was some overlap. Um, but you know, the findings are quite interesting. So as I hope you can see here, if you look at, um, let's see if this works, yep. So here's schizophrenia, and here is every other condition that was examined in this study. And you can see um, in the blue boxes, and especially the blue boxes with the stars, those are disorders that share a very significant amount of genetic loading with genetic loading for schizophrenia. In other words, the bulk of genetic risk for schizophrenia is also genetic risk for other psychiatric disorders. And this bears out 
what we've known for a long time clinically, which is that if you have a family history of schizophrenia, chances are you also have a family history of other things. Um, we also know, for example, that if you have, say, a child with schizophrenia, um, if you have another child, of course, that, you know, that child, because of the genetics, will have an increased risk of schizophrenia compared to the rest of the population, but they have an even bigger risk of things other than schizophrenia compared to the rest of the population, and it's because of this degree of genetic overlap. In neurology, interestingly, there was very little overlap across neurologic disorders like seizures and multiple sclerosis. And, I mean, to, to, for me, one of the great surprises was how little overlap genetically there is between psychiatric disorders and neurologic disorders. One of um, my colleagues at Mass General, Rudy Tanzi, who is one of the you know, biggest stars in the genetics of Alzheimer's, uh, has pointed out that um, in neurology, uh, in a way, what you see is um, a common final pathway where any number of biological problems uh, that are distinct from each other can lead to, say, stroke or multiple sclerosis or seizure disorder. But in psychiatry, it appears to be the opposite, where there is kind of a common early genetic pathway where you have a shared vulnerability to multiple psychiatric disorders if, say, you have an increased risk for schizophrenia. And I actually see that as a good thing because what it means is if you can intervene early enough, you may be able to stop not just someone's risk of de developing schizophrenia, but potentially their risk of developing any number of other psychiatric disorders. So I see this as a very positive development for our field. It's days like this that make me happy that I chose psychiatry instead of neurology, because I think that we're onto something important here that actually can make a big difference. So um, the other thing to say is that while, um, again, genetics are important, uh, they're important to schizophrenia, but to other psychiatric disorders, remember the genome is static. You are born with your genes, and that will not change, uh, with the exception of things like, say, a cancer where you have a mutation in a gene um, that you know, causes a biological process to happen that you know, was not built in when you were born, necessarily. Um, but genes change dramatically over the lifespan in terms of how and when they are expressed. So it's not just having the DNA and the genes. You have to turn the genes on and off. And the pattern of changing the genes on and off changes dramatically over the course of development. And in fact, it starts to change dramatically during prenatal development. So I, I tend to think of genetics as uh, kind of like a violin concerto. Um, and uh, the first step in the concerto is it's very difficult to have a violin concerto if you don't have a violin. And I think of the violin as the DNA itself, the structure, um, the backbone. Uh, you can't have a starting point without the DNA. You can't have a violin concerto without the violin. But if the violin is just sitting there and nobody is playing it, it's just a violin. On the other hand, if someone is actually playing the violin, then you're making music. Um, and to me, that music is kind of like gene expression. It starts and stops at certain times in certain quantities. Um, and um, you know, if you're playing a violin concerto, that's important to actually have someone playing the violin, but you also need to have some guidance as to how you play that violin. And that is what something called epigenetics is all about. So epigenetics is a part of genetics where there are markers along the genome that are helpful in regulation of those genes, meaning if you have a certain marker in a certain place, uh, that gene may know whether to turn on or off. Uh, so to me, it's kind of like the notes in the violin concerto. It tells you uh, what and when you should be playing a given note. But a concerto, of course, is more than one note. It's a long piece, and uh, this element of genetics has to do with that developmental timing part that I mentioned earlier. So as I said, the expression of genes, and certainly the expression of genes in the brain, changes very dramatically over the lifespan. And we, we know this from recent studies that have used um, post-mortem brain tissue from prenatal life all the way through old age. Uh, and we, looking at pieces of that brain tissue, we can see what genes are turned on and turned off at a given developmental time point. So for example, this particular gene, 
um, has very high levels of expression here in fetal life. This is second trimester tissue. Um, but then almost immediately after birth, it goes down, down, down to this much lower level of expression in adolescence and in adulthood. This, of course, is the opposite pattern where you have a gene that's really turned off during fetal life and then turned on uh, immediately after birth and again all the way through adulthood. And then there are other genes. Maybe. I'm stuck. Oh, there we go. There are other genes that are turned on all the time. Uh, we call this constitutive expression. So, you know, the level of gene expression here in the brain is basically the same in fetal life and all the way through adulthood. So you might imagine that these are incredibly important genes because they are active and turned on all the time. Um, whereas, say, these genes um, probably play less of a role in fetal development. These genes probably play more of a role in fetal development. So gene expression varies over time. Uh, it's important, but not specific to schizophrenia. But here's the other really important thing. These numbers for heritability are not 100%. If they were 100%, we would say these are totally genetic disorders. But it's less than 100%. And that additional 20% is quite important. So what is that 20%? It's the environment. So what environmental factors do we know of as being related to risk for schizophrenia and other kinds of psychiatric disorders. We tend to group these into two categories. Uh, one set of exposures happens in the years that precede the onset of illness. Schizophrenia typically strikes uh, in late adolescence or early adulthood. And what we see is that things that happen before those years can have an impact on risk for schizophrenia. And these are a few that have been especially well studied. Um, uh, one that I'll briefly mention, and you know, we'll hear from Dr. Evans more about this this afternoon, is cannabis use. Now, one problem with environmental studies like this, public health studies, is you never know uh, what the chicken is and what the egg is. So could it be that cannabis use in and of itself, marijuana use, increases risk for schizophrenia, or that people who have schizophrenia or early stages of schizophrenia tend to use marijuana more for other reasons? Um, some people talk about a self-medication kind of effect. And I think that there is strong evidence to support both of those ideas. Um, an interesting piece that just came out recently is that it turns out that the total amount of genetic loading for schizophrenia also predicts whether you use cannabis. So what that suggests to me is that um, there is a shared biology for cannabis use and schizophrenia. Um, and, um, you know, how to interpret this beyond that statement, I think, remains a mystery. But I think this, like everything in genomics, is an important starting point. The other category of risks, and the one that I'm going to focus on for the remainder of the talk, though, is what happens even earlier in prenatal, prenatal life, before you're born, and then early life. So this is a, a very uh, well-cited and reproduced figure from about 13 years ago now, looking at a whole bunch of environmental risk factors that have been associated with increased risk of schizophrenia. Uh, the way that you know it's increased is this measurement here called the odds ratio, uh, where uh, one is kind of general population risk of schizophrenia. Um, but let's say look at rubella infection during pregnancy. You can see if there is exposure to rubella infection during pregnancy, there's about a five times higher risk of developing schizophrenia compared to uh, the case where there was no rubella exposure during pregnancy. So unlike the genetics uh, numbers that I showed you before, where you know, each gene is contributing a tiny fraction of additional risk, these environmental factors actually contribute quite a bit of risk. The key is understanding how these factors may increase risk for schizophrenia, and even if they do increase risk, or whether it's just uh, a correlation. Uh, we always talk about if there's correlation, is there causation? And again, that's one of the challenges when you're looking at environmental exposures. But you'll see that there's a whole category here of obstetric exposures. And these are complications that happen not infrequently during pregnancy and childbirth, low birth weight, preeclampsia, 
uh, hypoxia. This is you know, one of the worst case scenarios where you have uh, some lack of oxygen delivery to the brain during childbirth, and that can either result in very subtle or not so subtle effects on, on the brain for the child. So it turns out that there have been a whole bunch of these obstetric complications that are associated with increased schizophrenia risk. So for one, that I think is pretty strong evidence that what happens even before you're born is very relevant to your risk of developing schizophrenia. Um, but also, it you know, may lead us to a potential mechanism that is relevant. And so uh, this gets to that's the second part of the talk, thinking outside the box and outside of the brain. And here comes the part where we discover that part outside the brain that may be relevant. So, we think of schizophrenia as a disorder of altered brain development, where risk for the disease begins very early in life during fetal development. Uh, and there may be things that continue to modify risk all the way up until the time that, the, that schizophrenia begins to declare itself in late adolescence and early adulthood. Um, so when we think about what we call the natural history of this disorder. We don't think of it starting just when somebody comes down with schizophrenia. We think that it probably starts many years before that. And understanding that pattern is not only important in helping us detect people who may go on to develop schizophrenia so that we can offer them early intervention, but also in understanding the root causes of schizophrenia. So the organ that I was talking about is the placenta which has been kind of long ignored in many areas of medicine. But if you think about it, it's really quite important because this is the main interface between the developing fetus and the mom. Nutrition, oxygen, everything that the fetus needs to survive and everything that the fetal brain needs to grow comes through the placenta. So let's say that there's a subtle problem with the placenta. Are there consequences for brain development later in life? So this very interesting paper um, from about six months ago now uh, indicates that the answer to that question is yes, there does seem to be a very important effect of the placenta on subsequent risk for biology. And not only is it important for schizophrenia biology, it's also important for our ability to interpret schizophrenia risk from genetics. So, what we see here uh, is on the y-axis something called a polygenic risk score. So remember before I showed you that genome-wide study where if we look under the whole Manhattan plot uh, at all of the variants together, they account for about 18% of the risk. So that 18% basically is reflected in this polygenic risk score. It's basically you look across all of, in this case, the 108 significant genome-wide hits for schizophrenia, and you make a score that basically calculates how many of those 108 hits you have as an individual. Um, and so, not surprisingly, if you look at a group of control, people who don't have schizophrenia, and a group of people who have schizophrenia, you see that that score is significantly higher in people who have schizophrenia. Not surprising, right? But let's say you then stratify by presence or absence of obstetric complications and other early life complications. What happens if you divide up this pattern into people who have versus don't have early life complications? So in the group that doesn't have early life complications, this is the same. Uh, whereas in those who do have early life complications, there's a significant difference. So one interpretation of this pattern is that even if you have high genetic loading for schizophrenia, if you don't have obstetric complications, you may not be at any higher risk than people who have, say, low genetic loading for schizophrenia, which I think is fascinating. Um, but then if you dig a little bit deeper, um, this is basically dividing up um, those schizophrenia risk, genetic risk scores into quintiles. So this is you know, the lowest 20% in terms of genetic risk for schizophrenia. This is the highest 20% in terms of genetic risk for schizophrenia. And then you look at the actual risk of schizophrenia. Um, and these are people who have no birth complications. Uh, one, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, I got confused. The blue are the people who have no birth complications. The red are the people who have birth complications. So in the low genetic risk group, there is no difference 
But as you go up and up and up, you see a bigger and bigger difference between um, people who have these complications and people who don't have these complications. So I think this is, this is basically a dose effect, which is fascinating. Um, and then the final piece of this paper, which I think is so interesting and important, is it turns out that those 108 genes are important to placental biology. Um, and if you have, say, a hypoxic injury to the placenta during childbirth, it is those genes that mediate the effects of that exposure on the placenta. Uh, so this all triangulates very nicely around the idea that schizophrenia genomics, in a way, is very similar to placental genomics and really identifies the placenta as a key mediator um, and, once again, squarely points to the fetal environment as being incredibly important for schizophrenia risk. So I'll conclude with uh, some recent results from our group that were published a few months ago that again, I think are encouraging in terms of our understanding um, things that can be done even in fetal life that may in the long term help protect against schizophrenia at risk. And I say may because it's early days in this research, but you gotta start somewhere. And I think that this may be a good step in the right direction. So let's say there's a family history of schizophrenia uh, and um, you have a, a young mother who is pregnant um, who is concerned, uh, you know, early in pregnancy, who's concerned about this family history and obviously has some concern about the developing baby. Um, based on that last study, I mean, it, it is useless to say to that woman, please try not to have any birth complications, right? No one wants to have birth complications and basically they can't be prevented. You do the best that you can in terms of prenatal care, but if you're gonna have a birth complication, you're gonna have a birth complication and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So the question that my lab is increasingly interested in is what can you do about it? Uh, what positive actions can you take either during pregnancy or even before pregnancy that ultimately could reduce the risk for schizophrenia and other uh, serious mental illness in, uh, in the offspring? Um, so another set of, or really one, uh, environmental factor that has been consistently associated with, in this case, a doubling of risk for schizophrenia is exposure in utero to starvation. Uh, and there have been several very large cohorts that have been studied prospectively after a, a, a period of famine uh, to see what happens to that child who is exposed in utero to famine conditions. Um, and one element that has emerged from those studies is that folic acid, which as you may know, is something that is recommended for all women of childbearing age to prevent spina bifida and other neural tube defects. Um, folic acid may play a key role in that relationship. What does folic acid do? Well, it's a vitamin, and what it does is it provides these little methyl groups, little biochemical group here, uh, and it tags the DNA with these methyl groups. And that is exactly what I was talking about before when I was mentioning epigenetics. Um, so this is the notes, right? This is the signal for a gene to turn on or off. Um, and folate is important in helping regulate that signal. So you see a potential connection to gene expression. And you know, by extension, folate during pregnancy may play an important role not only in the expression of genes in the developing brain during pregnancy, but after pregnancy as well. Because once you mark the genome with the methyl group, those marks tend to endure for a long time. So for genes that aren't expressed even during fetal life, but come online during those years, right before somebody develops schizophrenia risk, that signal, which may have been established during pregnancy uh, and may have been related to folic acid exposure during pregnancy, might even years later play an important role. So as I mentioned, there are these famine studies. Uh, now famine uh, and starvation obviously are uh, associated with a, a number of profound stressors, nutritional impairments, stress, uh, all sorts of hormone and other related imbalances that may be important for the developing brain. Um, but it turns out that in one of these big cohorts, they saw um, both an increase in schizophrenia say 20 years after exposure to famine. And you can see that, that doubling of risk very nicely here. These are kids 
you know, who were born right before and then during and then right after the famine. And you can see clearly that the ones that were born during the famine have a doubling roughly of schizophrenia risk, which goes back to normal. It turns out that within this group, there was also an increased risk of spina bifida, which is that neural tube defect that we know folic acid is protective against. So the parsimonious, you know, Occam's razor, one explanation for both phenomenon could be folic acid. It also turns out that folic acid is very important to subsequent risk for autism. And frankly, it amazes me that these recent studies have not gotten more press. Um, so there have now been four different cohorts that looked at prenatal folic acid exposure, uh, and specifically early prenatal exposure during the first trimester of pregnancy. And in all of the cases, risk for autism in the offspring was lower, and in three of the cases, significantly lower in the presence of early exposure to folic acid supplements. This happens across populations across the world. It happens in countries where they put folic acid in the grain supply and they don't put folic acid in the grain supply. It's a profound effect. I mean, it's something that potentially reduces the risk of autism by half, to me, is, is pretty amazing. Now, that said, of course, the risk of autism is not going down, it's going up. Um, so when people ask, well, you know, how do you square those, those two findings? Uh, the answer is I don't know, but uh, I would like to think that whatever is causing the increase in autism, that exposure to folic acid may help buffer that effect, whatever, whatever that is, um, which we are eager to find out, of course. It also turns out to be that certain exposures that are associated with increased risk of autism, that increased risk is mitigated in the presence of early exposure to folic acid in pregnancy. Um, so um, we, you know, based on, on this data in autism, and I should say autism is a different disorder than schizophrenia. It strikes earlier, much earlier in life, um, but there is clear genetic overlap and there is some overlap in symptoms. It's not unusual to have someone who is diagnosed with autism who then 15 years later is actually diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, so. Bearing in mind all of these findings, we were curious whether prenatal folic acid exposure might have a protective effect against risk for schizophrenia. Now, that is a hard question to study for lots of reasons, including the fact that you're talking about a 20-year delay between exposure uh, in utero to folic acid and when someone actually develops schizophrenia. So uh, that makes it hard to study. Uh, it's very hard to know how much folic acid is important. Uh, half of pregnancies are unplanned, so it's, it's hard to start very early in pregnancy and, and follow what's going to happen later on. But um, prevention is the holy grail, right? We have no prevention in psychiatry. We have no prevention for schizophrenia. Um, so to the extent that this may even contribute a small amount of signal uh, and a small amount of protection against uh, risk for schizophrenia and other serious mental illness, it's worth knowing. Uh, and in this case, we're not talking about exposing someone to an intervention that causes harm. We're talking about something that is safe during pregnancy, widely available, and already recommended uh, because of its prevention of spina bifida and other neural tube defects. That said, uh, the uptake, as I'll conclude with, is kind of low around that recommendation. Um, so there's definitely room to improve. So the other kind of shortcut that we took around this problem of you know, it taking 20 years to study is to look directly at the effects of prenatal folic acid exposure on brain development, not just schizophrenia risk. Uh, and we know that the trajectory of brain development tells us something about schizophrenia. Um, the, the cortex, the cerebral cortex, which is a thin outer ribbon of the brain, which is so important and really is what makes us human, uh, actually thins over the course of childhood and adolescence. And once you get past you know, age nine or so. It's a pretty linear pattern of thinning. And this is a good thing. This is probably pruning, uh, which is that process by which the connections between neurons get really refined and optimized. Um, myelination, which is where the insulation comes to help, you know, those, uh, insulate those, those signals that cross between neurons. Um, but, you know, this reduction as a whole, we think of as very, very important to brain development during adolescence. Um, and we see that there's this wave of thinning that goes across the cortex uh, as you go from, you know, say, childhood to early and mid-adolescence. But in schizophrenia, 
that wave of thinning happens too early and it's too strong. Uh, so we see, for example, in childhood onset schizophrenia, these are people who have very high genetic loading for schizophrenia, the cortex thins faster um, and earlier uh, than people who don't have child onset schizophrenia. So here's that nice linear pattern in healthy people. Here's that early and accelerated thinning in schizophrenia. Uh, it also happens to be the case that cortical thickness is an important biological marker of schizophrenia in that it is uh, a marker of increased risk for schizophrenia, as has been seen in numerous longitudinal studies of high-risk youth. Um, and it's also a marker of high genetic risk for schizophrenia. Uh, this was a study that was done here by Phil Lee and colleagues, uh, showing that basically um, genes that contribute to schizophrenia risk contribute disproportionately to the thickness of the cerebral cortex. So putting this together, we had this idea. Um, what if increased exposure to folic acid changes brain development in ways that might be relevant to schizophrenia? And rather than doing a 20-year prospective study, we decided to actually look in the other direction and look back in time to 1996 through 1998, which is when the United States first mandated that folic acid be put in the grain supply. So if you look at your box of Cheerios, you will see fortified with vitamins and minerals and you will see folic acid there. And the reason it's there is because it has a proven effect in reducing risk of spina bifida. Half of pregnancies are unplanned. So through passive exposure to folic acid through the grain supply, uh, even for people who are not trying to become pregnant, um, there is some protection against spina bifida. And you know, certainly after this intervention was rolled out, the rates of spina bifida went down in the US. Um, but not surprisingly, if you look at folic acid levels in the blood of women right before this intervention was rolled out and then right after the intervention was rolled out, it doubled. So we know that this intervention doubled blood folic acid in women of childbearing age across the population. So our question then becomes, was there a change in brain development related to this intervention where children who were exposed in utero to fortification look different uh, than children who were not. Um, so we just published these results a few months ago. Uh, we looked at a few different cohorts of children age 8 to 18. The first was just based on children who happened to get an MRI scan at Mass General for any reason. Uh, and their scan was read as being normal. We didn't include scans that had clear pathology. And then we looked at those brains just based on date of birth. We looked at kids who uh, you know, would have been born just before the rollout, during the rollout, and after the rollout. And this is what we saw. If you compare after the rollout to before the rollout, and you do a subtraction across the brain of the thickness of the cortex, what you see is a diffuse increase in the cortex thickness. Um, and furthermore, uh, if you look at the group that developed during the time of the rollout, there's an intermediate effect. Again, it's kind of like a dose effect. So the kids who were exposed have thicker cortex. And if you remember our model, thicker cortex, if anything, you might imagine to be protective. Um, so it turns out that not only is the cortex thicker, but the timing of cortical thinning changes so that it starts later. And that's actually why thickness is increased if you collapse across the whole age group. So um, what you see is that the group that was not exposed to fortification is already starting to show cortical thickness thinning at age eight, whereas those who were exposed, they're you know, starting a few years later. Um, and then hopefully this will work. This is just a video new. No. Uh, too bad. Not essential. So basically, what this is showing, <laughs> use your imagination, uh, is uh, that these changes are strongest in younger kids. Um, age 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And that really is interesting because it's very much in line with other data coming out from other groups that points to the emergence of subtle differences, say, in cognition and in brain structure and function uh, in children who have subtle signs of psychosis, even at this very early age. So, and here's this delayed thinning again. We actually replicated this result in another cohort from Philadelphia and found that in that cohort, Indeed, this delay in thinning itself predicted a lower likelihood of having psychosis spectrum symptoms. So putting that together, what we see is exposure to fortification appears to alter postnatal 
brain development in ways that may be protective against risk for psychosis and schizophrenia. Now, um, you might ask, well, fortification you know, has been in effect now for some time. Have we seen a change in the overall rate of schizophrenia incidents, say, in the United States? And the answer is we haven't because it only was 20 years ago. And schizophrenia tends to not really strike until a little bit later than that. Even that being said, you know, I'm not sure that we'll see a particularly strong signal in, in part reflecting the fact that we don't have great surveillance for you know, new diagnoses of schizophrenia in this country. Uh, ironically, the best surveillance in the world uh, for that sort of thing is, is here in nor Northern Europe. And if you look at this map of countries that do versus do not fortify the grain supply, you can see that there are only two countries in all of Europe that have made the decision to fortify grains with folic acid for very interesting reasons. And again, remember, this has nothing to do with schizophrenia or autism. All of these decisions have to do with spina bifida risk and neural tube defects. So I see this as an enormous opportunity. Half of the world right now is not exposed to fortification, when now, not only do we know that it's protective against spina bifida, but potentially it's protective against autism, schizophrenia, potentially other serious mental illnesses, bearing in mind the genetic overlap across these conditions. So um, between this, which I think you know, will require policy changes, um, and simply encouraging women of childbearing age to take folic acid supplements. So fortification is just passive exposure to the food supply. Supplements is when you actually take a pill of folic acid, which is already recommended by the Centers for Disease Control to prevent spina bifida, but less than a third of women of childbearing age are actually taking prenatal uh, folic acid supplements. So there's a lot of room to grow. Um, Interestingly, after many, many years, finally, the UK is now considering fortification. Uh, this was big news just a month ago. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see, first of all, if this happens, we can study this population, right? We can look prospectively to see what happens to autism and way down the line, we can think about schizophrenia. But the other thing is, what happens in, in the UK, we hope, will inspire the rest of Europe, although you know, there have been some recent divisions between the UK and the rest of Europe. Hopefully that does not extend to the level of folic acid fortification. Okay, so I will wrap up to, to leave some time for questions. Um, but you know, the three take home points I think are that it's genes and environment and it's their interaction very early in life that sets the stage for risk for schizophrenia. Very interestingly, the placenta may mediate some of that genetic and environmental risk. Um, and finally, you know, we have this finding which we're excited about uh, that folic acid early in pregnancy can uh, potentially change long-term brain development, probably through these epigenetic changes um, that ultimately may protect against risk for, for schizophrenia. So I will stop there uh, and briefly thank all of the um, collaborators that I have and individuals in my lab who worked hard to make uh, especially that last part of the study happen. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Josh. A uh, lot of interesting uh, questions. I try to uh, kind of group them a little bit, so uh, if you don't get hear your particular question, I'm sorry, it's just tons of questions. Um, sticking with uh, treatments uh, at this point, is there a baseline set of vitamin supplements that patients should take, and what would you include in that set of vitamins? Great question. So um, yes, we, we, we and others have looked at this question in people who already have schizophrenia. We, we, our group has done three trials actually of folic acid and in each case found some signal, particularly for negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So social withdrawal, lack of motivation, and these are the symptoms that antipsychotic medications actually don't help with. So what we see is a modest but statistically significant effect of folic acid on negative symptoms in schizophrenia. Given the, the risk profile, which is quite low, um, does it make sense to try? Sure. Um, it may not yield a big result, but you know, we think of everything in medicine as risk to benefit, and if the risk is low and there may be some benefit, it could make sense. Uh, we think that the bigger effects of folic acid may happen earlier in life, but again, there is some signal, and that's part of what inspired this work. We also did a trial of methylfolate, which is a different kind of folic acid. It's a, more, it's a proprietary formulation. So it, it's more expensive, insurance doesn't always cover it. We also saw some effect there for, for negative symptoms, but there hasn't been a head-to-head -head of those two types of folic acid. So at this point, if, I'm gonna, if, if I were to start with something, I would just start with two milligrams of folic acid. 
Thank you. That was a question what to actually take because there's a lot of products out there that have folic something in the name. Uh, what about choline? So I would say beyond folate, choline is the only other thing that has been convincingly studied as part of fetal development that may have some signal. So this is work out of um, uh, Denver, uh, Robert Friedman and his group. So choline is another dietary supplement um, that may be important in helping form uh, white matter uh, development in the brain. And what this group found was that moms who took choline during pregnancy, their infants actually showed some uh, patterns in electrical activity in the brain, which they measured you know, non-invasively by putting electrodes on the scalp, that appeared to be uh, protective. But we are a long way out from knowing whether that has some bearing on risk for schizophrenia. So that, you know, choline and folate really are the only two things uh, that have been studied to this point. And arguably, with folate, we now, I think, have more direct evidence in terms of its relationship to schizophrenia. So here somebody used a term that I like, so let me uh, tell you the question here. We have a lot of schizophrenia in my family. Both sets of grandparents went through uh, extreme famine uh, in their childhoods. Do genes have nutritional memories? Ugh. Great question. So th that is so cutting edge, I can't even begin to tell you. Uh, <laughs> So think about famine, and you know you don't get enough folate, you don't get lots of other potential nutritional elements that control methylation of the genome. Um, and you know the person who's developing during famine may be at increased risk for that reason. But one thing that we know about epigenetics is that it can be transgenerational. Um, and you know there is the possibility that if you study the next generation out, uh, even though they themselves were not exposed, uh, that there may be some signal. And you know, I think that there are groups that are actively working on that question, including the ones who studied the original famine groups. And so um, you know, and we don't know is the answer to the question, but is it biologically plausible? Yes, it is. Um, so we'll be very interested to see what happens there. A lot of questions really try to find out, you know, diagnosis, how do genes relate to diagnosis, uh, specifically, for example, what about genomic testing or gene testing, can you do this at this point and does it matter? Yeah, so yes, it can be done. I would say at this point, there is not really a good reason to do it as part of a schizophrenia workup and the main reason for that is that there's really nothing actionable that can come out of it. So I get calls not infrequently um, from families who have done genotyping for MTHFR, which is a gene that controls folic acid metabolism. Uh, and we've looked at that gene with respect to response to folic acid supplementation, and we see some signal. Um, but am I, e you know, even for a gene that has a well-known functional variant that definitely impacts folate metabolism, am I com comfortable at this point making a recommendation on what kind of folic acid to start based on that genotype? No. Um, I don't think that there's been sufficient head-to-head -head studies, as I mentioned. And regardless of what that genotype would show, I would say start with folic acid because it's more accessible, it's less expensive, and you know, we, we know that it has some efficacy. Um, beyond that, um, there's no question that medicine is moving in the direction of genetic testing and very likely whole genome sequencing. And you know, in the not so distant future, it is very easy to imagine that as soon as someone is born, they will have whole genome sequencing and that will become a part of their medical record and may be used to stratify risk for any number of disorders in psychiatry and the rest of medicine. But we're not there yet. Um, as I, you know, one of the interesting things again about that placenta study is even people who had very high genetic loading for schizophrenia did not get it if they didn't have a history of obstetric complications. So, you know, even there, uh, while we, it's great to have this nice quantifiable measure of genetic loading for schizophrenia, we're not yet in a position to be able to use that information clinically to inform decisions. So I would say not ready for prime time, but stay tuned. Maybe you can speculate a little bit though because there were quite a few questions about um, you know, the, the, the observation that symptoms are really nonspecific, even psychotic symptoms don't really necessarily point towards you have schizophrenia, it could be a variety of other things. Uh, to use biological things like genetic testing to subgroup patients, is there, do we, are we doing this now? Are, are there suggestions that there might be actually biologically distinct subgroups of schizophrenia or, or maybe not, based on what you showed, that in, in, in a way it, it's all somewhat more diffuse than you, we would like. 
Yeah, so, so the overarching picture at, at this point in terms of genomics is one of overlap. Um, where um, there's probably more sharing between, say, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder than there is things that separate the two. And we're not yet in a position to be able to tell, based on someone's genotype, what direction they are likely to go in. And remember, again, it's genes and environment. So it could be that what differentiates schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is not just subtle genetic differences, but subtle environmental differences uh, and the interaction of the two. So, you know, I'm very confident that as we learn more and more about the underlying genetic architecture of these disorders, that we will be able to use this information in a prognostic way. Uh, I guess my argument is we better pay attention to the environment as well, because it's not just about genetics. Um, and, you know, we're going to have to do a better job of capturing all sorts of aspects of the, of the environment. You know, folic acid is just one very small piece of, uh, you know, environmental exposure during fetal life and then after fetal life. Uh, so, moving target, um, but I think that, you know, there's reason to be optimistic that it will be useful. Is there a dark side to all of this? Uh, somebody uh, asks, uh, you know, just progress, but, uh, you know, is, is eugenics something that we're going to start to think about uh, the more you learn, we learn about, uh, you know, genetic risk for disorders like schizophrenia? Anybody see the movie Gattaca? Great movie, maybe 20 or so years out. So in Gattaca, there's this futuristic society where everybody gets that genotyping right when they're born. In fact, most births are not the, the old-fashioned way they happen in test tubes because of genetic engineering. They want people to be genetically perfect. Um, at the time, this was pure science fiction. Um, less so now. We're still a ways away from that. But this is a really important question. Um, there are many areas of science where the science gets ahead of the ethics, uh, and genetics could easily be one of them. Um, so uh, I think it's very important that as we go forward in this area, we have an ethical framework to do that. And certainly, you know, it, this varies by country, right? You can't do human cloning in the U.S., but there are efforts to do something very similar in other countries. Uh, so absolutely, we need to keep an eye on it. Um, that, you know, there is a dark side um, that is real, and you know, more practically, there's a question of, you know, well, what happens if my insurance company gets a hold of that genome-wide testing and sees that I, you know, I statistically increase risk for schizophrenia? You know, that's that's problematic too. Um, so, is the security of genetic information? I think in in a few years is just is going to be just as important as the security of you know your credit card number and your social security card number. You don't want people to have it if, uh, if you can avoid it um, for all sorts of reasons. Thank you, Josh. Thanks.